Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Shane Needham. That's me, where our theme is never be outworked. And we talk about a lot of things, never be outworked. And you guys certainly have shown uh, and you're great examples of the never be outworked mindset. And we'll talk about that and just some of the things that I've seen from your guys' program. Inspirational. Today we'll be talking, it's, it's Secrets of Success podcast, episode number 25. We're talking about building a dynasty in any organization, the story of Post Falls High School, Idaho, Post Falls, Idaho High School Wrestling. Not only high school wrestling, but also the, the, the kids program, the clubs program. And we'll talk about that. And so follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook, follow me on LinkedIn, visit my website at drsdenham.com. I also have a YouTube channel, a Spotify channel, iTunes and SoundCloud, where you can see all my previous podcasts. They are, are, are edited and ready to go so you can watch those. I am joined here with head coach, Pete Reardon of Post Falls High School Wrestling Program, and he ha is helped by a whole bunch of coaches. And we we have with us today uh, Lonnie Lovett and Abel De La Rosa. They're some of the coaches of the program as well. And I just want you guys to know, again, I, I had a stint uh, for Moscow Wrestling Club, I think for about six or seven years. When I took that over, I modeled the program after you guys. And we had a, a great run. I'm sad to say that once I stepped down, they haven't had um, a season for over a year now. But um, I, I modeled it after you guys, and we had huge success. I had all, over 80, almost 100 kids in that program at one point. And so thank you very much for just inspiring me. We'll talk about some of the examples that you actually guys, you, you guys were. And so thank you very, very much. Callers, you can call in. You'll see the stream at the, at the, the banner on the, uh, the streaming at the bottom of the, of the website. Call in. Ask these guys something. Ask me something. This is a, the podcast of Secrets to Success with Shane, Dr. Shane Needham, where we are a voice of science, of business, of leadership, of relationships, of bodybuilding, of powerlifting, anything with the theme of never be outworked. And thank you very much to the viewers, the audience, the, the listeners. I've had over 100,000 engagements in the last month. One of our YouTube videos had 2,200 views just last week. Uh, potential collaborations and sponsors all over the place. Thank you very much. I'm very, very grateful and very, very humbled by everybody that sends me these social media requests and posts that say, hey, Shane, um, you, you've inspired me to never be at work. So thank you very much. So Abel, Pete. Lonnie, thanks for joining me. Um, I, I want to start by just kind of giving some introductions. We'll start with, with, with you, Lonnie. So, Lonnie, can you introduce yourself? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my name is Lonnie Lovett. I am the director of Team Real Life Wrestling Club. Um, I've been, uh, been with the club from, from its origin almost 20 years ago now. I um, started out of a small home group that I was in. had a bunch of old wrestlers in it. And somebody had a crazy idea about joining it for starting a wrestling club. And... Um, it's, I have the youngest kids, so I was the last one left doing it, So, and I'm still doing it now. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit about Team Real Life. How does it get its name? And, of course, we're going to talk a lot about this today because it's some of your success. That's my opinion in, in observing you and other sports organizations and other, other great teams. But what's the connection between Team Real Life and Real Life the Church? So um, we're actually a bridge ministry for Real Life Ministries. It's, a, it's headquartered here in Post Falls, Idaho. Um, we started, I was in actually in a Bible study with uh, Jim Putman, who's the senior pastor at Real Life Ministries, and a couple of other guys, a guy named Rod Clutchton, another fellow named Mike Smith, Rick Durbin, who's from Post Falls, and myself. We were all former wrestlers. Um, most of us wrestled in college at least a little bit, and had some success at either high school and college, or both, or one or the other. And uh, we decided that we'd do this on a, on a whim, actually. And we started the, started the wrestling club out of that. We didn't have a place to wrestle. We didn't have any mats. We hopped around from, we wrestled at NIC, we wrestled at Lake City High School. We wrestled wherever we could roll out a mat. Eventually, we settled in the auditorium of the church and removed chairs every day for practice, gold mats. Rolled the mats back up, put the chairs back down. Um, we did. Um, and it's, it, it, at times over the years, it's been an outstanding ministry. And it's always been a great wrestling club. It hasn't always been an outstanding ministry. It's a lot easier running a wrestling club for me than it is to run a ministry. But they, every once in a while, they come and out of my cage and make sure that my, my focus is right, my priorities are right, and I'm doing it for the right reason. 
Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Congratulations to you. I know it's a lot of work. I've done it myself and uh, kudos to you. And it's great that you've learned how to surround yourself with good people as well. And that's a very, very important thing. So really good job, Lonnie. And it's, uh, you know, um, we'll talk about this, but it's about something bigger than wrestling. And I think you absolutely realize that. And you guys know that's why you're successful. That's That shouldn't be, but you believe it or not, that's hard for other organizations to understand. And we'll, we'll get into that. So Abel, you're next. Abel Del Rosa. Um, I got involved with the program probably 14 years ago. I met Lonnie out where I was uh, digging some ditches, and um, it, it was actually some post holes for put up signs in the development. And I saw Lonnie, and, and we got to know each other a little bit. And then I started getting phone calls from Matthew McLeod, or not Matthew McLeod, but the McLeod's dad. Right, right. He, he told me to um, come on over and help with practice, I was coaching at Central Valley Wrestling Club at the time, and at the middle school at Green Acres, and and I would uh, show up there, they would wait for me because I'd be late, and, and after that, I became mean, the coach. I don't even know how, but. They roped you into it, and you couldn't say no, of course. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. you know, there you have such a good yeah. reputation. You guys all do, by the way. Um, and you know, so many people are like, "Man, I'm I'm worried when Abel's kids graduate from high school because I don't know what he's going to do. I'm worried when Lonnie's kids graduate from high school. I don't know what he's going to do." So that's the rumor on the street that I'm sure you guys have 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 heard before. So, yeah. so Abel, um, I, I so. Abel and I were in the same district. Let's see, district or regionals? Regions. We were in the same region. Um, I, what year did you graduate? 87 or 88, Abel? 87. 87. 87. Yeah, so he was a badass state champion from Sunnyside High School. And, uh, and that was back then before we had digital pictures. And I can still remember his picture. And everybody saw the pictures of all the kids that went to state. And they're like, do not screw with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some crazy stories about him and Tim Mason and who beat who and all these crazy stories, but we won't get into those. So uh, anyway, and Abel is also the dad of three boys. And I just know these facts because I followed his kids because they're all great kids, great wrestlers, amazing wrestlers, but better, better yet, great character kids. So let's see, between the three children in high school, if you get me right, um, seven seven time state champions, two runner ups, and then three more state places. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 So they've all placed at state seven. Uh, one was a four time state champion, one's a three time state champion, and then the other one that was a, both of them actually, Matthias and AJ were both runner ups at one point, right? Yeah, that's right. So to you, that doesn't happen without being a great dad. And I, I love that your kids always laugh in the room. By the way, we'll talk about that because I think that's important. <laughs> so um, thanks thanks very much, Abel, for joining us today. So Pete, um, you're next. Okay, so I'm Pete Reardon. I teach and coach here at Post Falls High School. This is my, I'm starting my 12th year as a head coach uh, here at, at Post Falls. And uh, I've been teaching here for that long in the district. And I taught and coached for five years in Washington uh, at Kent Lake High School before I moved to Post Falls. And, uh, so I've been here for 12 years now. So I, I sort of, you know, I'm, I'm the newer one of all these guys, but I inherited, uh, you know, a, a, a post which was uh, pretty sought after, you know. I mean, I, at least by people I think that were looking from the outside that sort of knew what was going on on the inside. And what I mean is, I, I knew that these guys, and I didn't know Abel at the time, but I knew Lonnie uh, a little bit through family and so forth. And so I knew that there was some some work going on for a few years in the community through the church, getting this thing going. And and they were just kind of starting to have some some of those good kids get into the high school when I when I took the helm. So that they had already started to get their hands dirty for a few years, you know, and those kids had started to come. So. Well, that's that's awesome, and it's uh, it, to be able to take that program over. It sounds like you're walking into a gold mine. However, what I want to, you know, what I, and it might sound like that, but obviously there are huge expectations there. And I will tell you, Pete, most people couldn't fill those shoes, not even close. You you are somebody that kids. I've seen it in camps. I've seen it, um, I, you know, at state championships. I've seen it at districts. You're the kids that really look up to you, and so do the parents. And that, believe me, that's not the case with all coaches. It's just not. You know, every team has to have a leader that people aspire to, even if that person's never stepped. For example, if that person's never stepped a foot on the wrestling mat, they have to aspire to that person. 
And so and you're that person. So really, really good job, Pete. So Pete, I'm going to put this one, this question in your in your uh, wheelhouse. Sure. If if you can just right off the top of your head, share some of the success statistics of your program since you've taken it over. The stats. Yeah, just some of the state championships, individual champions. Do you know of any any of that? Just the ones you know off the top of your head. The ones I know off the top of my head, I mean, we won five out of the last six state titles, so I know that one for sure. Um, I think because the one that we didn't win stings the most of, of probably the last 10 years, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, I was there. Was That was by a point or two, wasn't it? Uh, you know, it ended up being about uh, – it ended up being a few more, but we, we did lose one to Lewiston by 13 and a half. We, at the end of that one to Columbia, they ended up winning by about 30 something points. Oh, is that right? Okay, I didn't remember uh, that. Okay. They ended up having a couple of places at the end of one. And, Got it. Um, but we did lose one by 13 and a half to, to Lewiston, uh, yeah. my third year. So, or for, yeah, my third year. So that one was close enough that I remember for sure. And the one yeah. we won this year was only four and a half points. So that one was a close one this year for sure. So five five out of the last um, six state team state championships. Do, yeah, can yeah, you count an individual champs or something we've had in the last? He knows thirty seven thirty seven champs we've had in the last how long? In the last twelve years. Last twelve years thirty seven. Thirty seven state champions in twelve years. That's not counting all the other state places. There's Holy no Toledo. Somebody was talking to me today about this potential podcast. They're like, so post falls, when they go to state, do they have sometimes multiple guys in the same weight class in the championship? I'm like, oh, that happens every year. <laughs> yeah, every year. We wrestled each other one year. I, uh, I think it was my third year we wrestled each other twice in the state finals. Yeah. That wow. year. <laughs> Incredible. There was a couple of years ago there were there were two in the state final two. Yeah, big happened, uh, and then just a couple of years ago we had two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember that year too. So incredible so you can only 37 champions in 12 years you can only imagine them are state placers you can only imagine the number of runner-ups just really, really incredible so and you know for non-wrestling fans out there that is just hard to reproduce i mean a lot of kids in a lot of programs i'll give you examples of certain programs i won't name them but they just want to go to state they don't even think about winning it because they don't have anybody in the room that's ever won it so if you don't have anybody that's ever won it you can't even look up to that person. And so you guys have done a great job of setting the bar. And, you know, Pete shared with me his playbook yesterday, about nine different emails, um, how to develop kids, how to develop coaches, what tournaments they go to, how to train, and talk about a never be at work mindset. And I told this to Pete earlier. I could share that playbook with 100 different people, and they couldn't reproduce it, not even close, because they're not willing to. They're not willing to. And you guys are willing to. So um, what a great success story. And it doesn't even talk about the kids, the success stories of your, of your kids and their character. So talk a little bit about that. Lonnie, I'll let you talk about that since you're heavily involved in ministry. One of the things you see when you see, when you go to Tri-State, a big tournament, or Raleigh Lane, or at the state championships, you see all your kids over there separately, usually one of the older kids, a senior or something. They're all – and they're all praying together. Describe how that happens. How does it make you feel? How does that happen? Who, who makes that happen? It's, it's actually a culture that starts in the youth program. So, so a lot of those kids you're seeing at the high school level um, have come through the program. Almost all of our kids have. We've been, we've been really fortunate with that to bring kids up, you know, something starting as young as four years old and bringing them all the way through the program. Well, we're, we're a Christ-based wrestling club, which is it's, it's easier to say than to do. But we, we do do our best to do it. Um, we do pray with the kids every day. We share real life devotions, real life situations um, every day. But a prayer is, is, is absolutely a standard. We started the practice with the prayer. Um, we started the tournament with the prayer. Just a lot of our kids don't know wrestling without faith. Yeah. Some, a lot of our kids, maybe even maybe even a majority of them, the only faith in their life or the only exposure to this is wrestling. So it's wow. one of the same for a lot of those kids. I mean, not all of them, uh, but that is absolutely a culture that starts at, at the youth level, and it's completely, completely um, compounded by Abel. He he leads that most of the time in the wrestling room. He's the guy on the mat with the kids every day. I'm not always on the mat coaching, um, but he is, and he 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 lives it out, and he leads a team in prayer. And we also bring in coaches and 
parents and dads and they buy into that as well. And some of them pray with us and pray with the kids for the first time they've ever done in their life. But to, to see it reflected on the high school level starts ground level when we do that's awesome. Well, kudos to you, all you guys for being great examples. And, and, and Abel, I've seen that at tournaments, that, that you how you've led some of those things too. And one of the things that, like I said, I, I modeled Moscow Wrestling Club after you guys, and I started immediately praying when I took over the program. And th there were a few people that said, oh, you're going to offend people. And you know what? I would say 99 parents said, oh, my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. This is so cool. And one parent would say, we're offended. And I'd say, okay, you can go to another club. And they would leave. But I was not going to change for that one loud minority of a person. It's just, it wasn't willing. And we had a really, really great thing going. And so many, especially like a single mom, they loved those kind of things because they didn't have that discipline in the room. They just didn't have it at their home. So they, their discipline would come when they'd go to wrestling practice. And it was really, really cool. So how cool is that? You guys, you've, um, what your kids have aspired to is everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Your kids in the program don't want to just be a wrestler. They want to be a great who follows God. And that's, that's one of your favorites. I've studied it. That's it. And you guys know that, you know, I don't have, but that's, what's going to go in my book, believe it or not. And you guys are one of the models of that. So really, really good one job. The, one of the things I would add to that too, which, which goes along with that. And I, I just, as we're, as you guys are talking about this, it, it, it kind of jogged my memory years ago. Um, I, from time to time, I meet with Jim Putman, who, you know, the, the pastor, senior pastor of real life. I meet with him and we'll just, just to, just to chit chat or whatever. But sometimes you get into kind of some chalk talk, you know, talking about leadership and he's kind of a, he's really into that stuff. Like, like Aaron, you know, Aaron and, yeah, and absolutely. Guys, you know, they lead these big organizations, and so they're they're really good at this stuff. But I remember years ago, um, I was just picking his brain about team building, just the same exact stuff we're talking about. I remember him saying, because I was trying to tell him, like, how do we, like, how do I get kids to buy into some of these character things that we're trying to sell them, you know? And these guys were the model that was already doing it. And Jim said, look, whatever you celebrate is what becomes important. Whatever you celebrate consistently becomes important. And so, you know, you look at these guys praying with kids. You look at these guys doing devotionals with kids. To the point where I remember one parent at one point, like my second or third year here, it practice didn't, like it was supposed to start at like 6 to 7.30, and it probably didn't start till 6.35 or 40, because the guy we had coming in talking, Chandler Rogers that night, went 40 minutes. But he was talking about God and character and all these things, and it's like, we will set aside time. Like if we don't start practice till halfway through practice, we'll run it a half hour long. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. We're going, celebrate, we're going to celebrate the important thing. You know? Yeah, that's so awesome. So Abel, how would you describe this, the success and how you've helped accomplish that maybe at the club level? I would say that the majority, when, we, when you, God is your rock, it's, like you can go into every match, I feel like, um, with a little bit of an advantage. They don't worry about the wins and losses so much. You know, they they can pray, they get uh, some of that anxiety out, and they feel empowered a little bit. You know, um, which you know gives you a little bit of uh, an advantage, which they fully like that. Um, and then also too, I like they were saying earlier, people come to our practices. Um, to get wrestling, and in the end, they get something else, and yeah. they, they get a little bit of God, and it always comes back. Later on, some of these kids get older, and they're in high school, and man, it always comes back. You know, sometimes they start making some bad choices, but in the end, uh, they remember the stuff that we've taught them and that we preached, and that God should be the rock in your life all the time, and, and I think that kind of helps with with our success, but. You know, and, and you're a great example of that, and so is your brother, by the way. I just uh, I love how you guys preach, and you're not afraid to, and I think that's awesome. Um, we have too many in our people that are in our society who are afraid to speak their real, I guess their real thoughts and their real emotions, and it really holds a lot of people back because they're afraid they're going to offend people because people get easily offended nowadays. Well, I guess you'll have to move on because more people are inspired than offended, and so really, really um, good job. So. Pete, in all the information you sent me yesterday, I mean, it was amazing. I want to, I want to hone in on, on a couple of things. So, describe this Cybel system to me. So, for those that don't know the Cybel system, 
So um, Ron Seibel, amazing wrestling coach from um, Moses Lake, Washington, he was at the program for years and just an amazing coach. I don't think he actually ever won a state championship individually himself, but an amazing coach. So there's just – he was in Sports Illustrated once as having one of the – highest winning percentage duels of all time or something like that. Yeah. And so describe the Cybel system. And believe, right, Abel, when you'd go wrestle Moses Lake, everybody yeah. was afraid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about what I know about it. And then Abel, I know, knows a ton about it too. Sure, sure. His brain and, and I know he's been, he's competed against, he competed against those teams for a long time. Um, you know, I remember years ago, um, it would have been back when I was in college. I was wrestling at Central Washington University, and Coach Seibel came and did, like, the Washington Coaches Clinic at at, uh, at Central Washington University. And I went and, and just – I went to help out. They wanted some local kids to help out run the clinic, and then I just watched, of course. And I knew the guy, but I didn't know – him. I knew that Moses Lake had won, you know, 10 or 15 times, whatever it was. You know, you look in the 80s and 90s, it's Moses Lake, Moses Lake, Moses Lake, Moses Lake. <laughs> It was amazing. Yeah, you know what I mean? And so I just listened to the guy, and I remember listening to him and him talking about about drilling a ton. And I remember – and then I talked to Coach Brent Barnes and lots of other people that knew Coach Seibel and knew about Coach Seibel um, and picked their brains about, like, what did he mean by this? And so a lot of it centered around – and Abel can build on this too, but he had this more principle that, that focused more like 80% of drilling and, and technique and 20% of live wrestling, much more like the Russian style of system. Like Russians don't – they don't take kids to tournaments when they're four or five years old. Like you don't get a wrestling in a tournament until you've learned these skills. And you might not learn them until you're 10 or 12 or 15 years old. That's right. Right. And so they emphasize a lot more like spending time on the craft before you actually. And so just, I think Seibel was a lot more about that. I'll let Abel talk about it too. But. Yeah. When I, when I met Seibel, I was coaching at uh, East Valley with Craig Hansen, who I learned a massive amount from. He's a good coach. And we went to the national tournament. When I got to hang out with Seibel, I figured we're going to go to the NCAA together. We're going to be on a plane. I'm going to sit next to him. I'm going to talk, ask him. I'm going to, he's going to pick his brain because he's the best coach in the history of the state of Washington. Right. So, so I, so I pick, so I picked his brain on the way down there. I picked his brain while we're at the tournament. I, anytime I could. And what I got out of it was basically he drilled, 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 drilled until his kids were chomping at the bit. They wanted to wrestle life. They wanted to right. wrestle. Life. But he knew that they had the skill set before that he allowed them to do that. And usually it would be right before Tri-State for No live wrestlings are right before Tri-State. They might have, uh, he might have even said that they went beyond Tri-State before they started live wrestling. Um, but the, all, the end goal was to get all the repetitions down so it became very natural for them. And then they would peak at the state tournament. Everything was a peak at the state tournament. And some of the other things that Stival taught me was, um, Scouting, how to scout. I feel like I can scout guys with the best of them. I, I we, we can figure out how to beat some guy here or there, or whatever. Because I will reform it. One about tendencies, weight stance, all sorts of different things to help us uh, get an advantage there and matches if somebody we did lost. The thing that Seibel and Brent Barnes and guys like that really did for me was well, one the actual particulars of their system is part of it. But beyond that, it was just the idea that they had a system. Yes. And they implemented it, and they were willing to improve and change upon the system. Absolutely. But they yes, had sir. core beliefs that they absolutely believed. And that was like a mind changer for me. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. And so you guys are all familiar with Mark Sprague. And when I took over the Moscow Wrestling Club, I'm like, hey, Mark, what do I have to do? How do I make this successful? And he says, two things. Run it like a business and get, and get a system. And that really, really helped. And it really, really did. And so I had a playbook and everything, and I would change it and modify it and so on and so forth. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard the rumor about um, Ron Seibel, but here, here's what his, his words, what kids say that ever wrestled for him. He'll scout a kid, like a kid might beat you during the season, and he'll scout the match, and the kid will never beat you again. Ron <laughs> <laughs> yeah, told me that story one time. He said, uh, he said, he, he said Ron Seibel was the best the best scouter ever. He said one time there was a kid, I can't remember the, the exact kid, the names don't matter, but this has been, you know, 20 years ago when Brent was still kind of earlier in his career. He said his kid wrestled the Moses play kid and beat the kid, majored him the first time they wrestled. And then they wrestled again at another tournament prior to Christmas, like Tri-State. And, and it was closer the second time, like a three-point win. And then Seibel kept calling Brent and bugging him to let him in his tournament in January. 
so that his team could come to his tournament in January. And he figured out later it was so that he could see this kid a third time. This kid ended up beating him in the state finals. <laughs> Is <laughs> that he, right? That's what he wanted. He wanted that kid to be able to see the, the, the Lake Stevens kid a third time before the state finals. And he that's it. That's interesting. You know, I wanted to focus on that because I was going to bring that up and you guys already brought it up, the 80-20 drill live thing. And so, uh, you know, there's quite a few people watching right now. I can see them online. And, you know, you go into a lot of wrestling programs. And I know when I when I even first went into, you know, the Moscow Wrestling Club program, right, it's going to these other programs, and I'd watch these six-year-olds wrestle live, it made no sense to me. And I'd watch these eight-year-olds wrestle live. It, you're learning bad habits. And so I started talking to NCAA coaches and and uh, shout out to Troy Steiner. I remember talking to him and he's like, well, here's what the Russians do. You start training when you're five, you drill, and you don't do your first tournament until the age of 14 and you're a world champion by age 16 or 17. <laughs> I mean, and so it's, I, you know, and I, I've, I've thought about that mindset. I would love to hear you guys' input. I think it's more about the parents wanting their kids to do live and tournaments and win medals at these early ages, which I, one of the things that I, I, I saw, here's what I would see. I would see an eight year old wrestler start wrestling and never have any experience. And he'd have three weeks under his belt and his mom would say, let's go to that tournament. I'd say, mm, no, I wouldn't do that. And they say, well, oh, we're competitive. Okay. So he goes to the tournament. He goes 0 and 5 in a round robin and he never wrestles again in his life because he hates it. And so I started telling people at least two years, do not take these kids to tournaments for two years. And so and that made a big difference. Our, at one point, our our turnover in our program was less than 5%. Out of 100 kids, we would lose two or three, four. And, at one, and a lot of wrestling coaches, you guys have heard this, they brag when they say, we lost 50% of our kids the first week. That was awesome. No, it's not. <laughs> no, you just lost – a potential kid that might five years from now be an, a great champion. So you, whatever you guys are doing, you're doing it awesome because you retain those kids. So really, really good job. So you build that character. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, here's Pete. This is for you, I think. Okay. Did you Are you the one that came up with talking about the Stocksdale Paradox, which I love, by the way? Yeah. Okay, so Pete, tell everybody about the Stocksdale Paradox. This is going to help everybody – in life in general and by the way i'm an extreme optimist and i totally understand the point of this story so it's great so so uh uh admiral jim stockdale was i believe the highest ranking um if i remember right the highest ranking uh military member that spent time in the hanoi hilton in, in vietnam so he had been there for a number of years i want to say you know go back and read the story but i want to say it was like six or seven years something so he like was a prisoner of war for six or seven years. Years. yeah for a long time and, and so um and, and i've done some reading on him and, and the first time i heard about him was through um was jim collins book uh good to great uh great awesome awesome business book i've read that a couple of times it's great book great story and i believe that this story was in there and jim collins was talking about it and so and anyway, Jim, uh, Admiral Stockdale, basically the Stockdale Paradox was named by Jim Collins, who wrote the book. But he was talking about the idea that, you know, this never give up and this this always willing to overcome and always willing to overcome anything, no matter what the circumstance is. And he was talking about that mindset. And, and in business, having the mindset that no matter what odds you're facing, you've got to keep pushing on, no matter what. No matter what the odds are, you might and you might be facing some really ugly, difficult, daunting decisions, right? And, and, and this is coming from a guy who's literally spending time in in as a prisoner of war. So, um, you know, when we compare our stuff to that, it's like not a big deal. But anyway, he, he basically talks about you know just the struggle of people that were in, in in prison there, and the fact that the ones that didn't make it out were the optimists. And he's like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the people who all we got to do is make it to Christmas. All we got to do is make it to the New Year. If I can just make it to Easter, if I can just, and he said, those people die of a broken heart. Those people die because they lose their hope. And he said, you know, you got you to gotta sort of be a stoic in a, in a certain way and a realist in a certain way and be able to face the cold hard facts and say, you know what, no matter what, no matter what, we're, we're going to be okay and we're going to push through this and, and you'll make it through. And, you know, I think that's where faith comes in you know, a, a big time to know that, that we, you know, we all get to a certain age, 
you know, and you realize you have very little you can control. But you know that God has a plan. My favorite, my favorite verse in the Bible is Jeremiah 29, 11. God has a plan and it's really, really good. And if, you know, if we can remember those things that in all the uncertainty that we live in our lives, especially nowadays, that everything will be okay. I don't know if that's optimistic or not. I, I just know that sometimes life is going to throw curveballs at us a lot, but there's a good plan for us. And I think that's probably, I don't, I read good to great. I don't remember the stock um, Dale paradox in there, Pete, that Jim Collins called it. Did, did he talk about that Admiral having faith? Do you, do you remember? I, you know, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, I, don't I, do, I do remember them talking. At, 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 now, this is where I don't remember if it's, uh, if it's Jim Stockdale or another prisoner of war that I read about, but 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 in the same Hanoi Hilton and the discussion in there by it was either Stockdale or this other one, and they're talking about, um, you know, they, they they when they had little hope, what they did was they 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 searched into whatever talents they had and they shared them with each other. One guy preached the gospel because he was. He was an ordained minister. Another guy taught them about how to build an engine because he was a mechanic back home. Another guy. And so that's how they got their way through it was they shared their faith with each other. You know, I mean, and, and really, really, you know, witness to each other and get them to get each other through. Which, and the other thing, and not, not to take too much more time here, but the other thing that really, that the Stockdale Paradox really uh, pulls it right back to our program, our kids, and, and, it, and, it, and it's this. It's the point that we try to create it. That we try to create this this um, environment where it's safe for kids to compete to their fullest. Because I guess what I'm saying is that we love try to love our kids on a level where their success is. Or we don't tie our love to them by their success. Their wrestling isn't what determines you know their self worth for us. And I think that once kids understand that, then they're bought in. You know, then they're bought into something that's bigger than them because they're not scared to compete. Absolutely. You know, gosh, it's just great talking to you guys. I, I, I love the like mindsets. And I tell my kids this. Um, sometimes they think it's that I'm not proud of them, but I say, I'm proud of you for who you are, not for what you do, because you're a gift of God. And they're like, well, you're, you're not proud of my good grades? Well, sure, I'm proud of your good grades. <laughs> but no, I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm not going to always love your behaviors, but I'm going to love you no matter what. And you can, you know, I, I've never seen a post balls kid, whether it be in team real life, I've never seen them throw headgear. I've ne the, the most, let's see, the most passionate and enthusiastic one on the sidelines is Pete Reardon. <laughs> I love that, by the way. Never get rid of that enthusiasm. I love it. Oh, man. I, I don't think I've ever seen Abel make an emotion, actually, on the sideline. <laughs> uh, no. Which is probably good, but you guys are just great. And so I wanted to break this down because you guys have all those elements. And so I have these elements that I've seen in successful team building, and I've actually trademarked it. It's called FACT, F-A-C-T. Okay. F is for fun, family, friendships, and fulfilling. We're going to get into the fun part. That's it. A is for autonomy. You guys do that as well. I looked at your books. We'll talk about that. C is for competence. You guys do that as well. We'll talk about that. And team is for, T is for team. Everybody, I mean, everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So I'm going through, I want to tell this story. Um, Abel, you were in the room and I just loved it. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm an intense guy. You guys probably know that, you know, um, and I have fun being intense. I have fun competing. I have fun winning. I have fun doing those things. Not everybody likes my style of intensity. And so I was looking at you guys' success on your program, in your program. And I'm thinking, okay, what else can I do differently? And I'm talking and I'm reading and I'm talking to sports psychologists who have PhDs in psychology and they're talking to Olympic athletes and all these things. And one of the things is, is you have to have fun. And so I remember talking to Abel about it. I don't know if this was after or before, but I'll tell talking to Abel. And Abel, you were actually talking to Coach um, Sprague. We all know him very, very well. He's like a he's like a father figure to me, and he's like a grandson to my my boy. And I, a post fall, he was going up against. I think it was like a, a kids tournament, and a, a Sprague kid was going up against the post falls kid. And the post falls kid won. I don't remember if it was Ridge or not. I don't think it was actually. I think it was. Somebody else. Do you remember the, the, the actual match, Abel? I can't remember the match, but it might have been a, a kid named Tyler that we had on. Oh, team. okay. Okay. And and I remember Sprague saying, how do you guys do it? How do you guys always beat me or something like that? And, you're, and Abel's like, coach, we have fun. 
And that's true. And I think, Abel, I think that's a set of, you know, um, uh, an example for all of you, you really know how to have fun. I've tried to do that with myself. My personality is not like that, I'm afraid. But anyway, I've tried. <laughs> but I, 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 I tell this story, and then I, I'll, I want you to um, um, comment on this, Abel. I'm in the Post Falls wrestling room. We're in a, we're in a camp. I'm not going to use any kids' names or the coaches' names. We're in this camp that a coach was having um, in your guys' room, and this coach is intense. His idea of fun is training from midnight to 8 a.m. on a Friday night, okay? And two of the Post Falls kids all weekend long are sent off in the corner doing push-ups. <laughs> And I'm like, but they were laughing. They were having a good time and we were training hard, but they were always having fun. And I think there's something to that. And um, obviously both of them are state champions. Um, I mean, I, I won't mention them, but they're great, great wrestlers. And so tell me about the F of the FACT of the fact, tell me about the fun in the program and how, what you put into that, Abel. Well, to me, it's part of my personality. I'm a fun guy. I like to, around it i mean there's times where like, i have I, a little bit of you in me also too when you get down to nitty gritty but like before practice i want to have i want kids to have like it's play time and i'll even start practice late the parents will get upset like hey we're starting 15 minutes late i go look at your, your kids all your kids are playing like maniacs that's fantastic to me they're get there it's functional to me it's practical it's wrestling practical but you're basically just wrestling the room got you know 50 60 70 kids and they're just going nuts i'm like yeah let them play let them play. That's they, a great they idea. In that they don't even know they are because they're just having a good time. And then when we start our warm ups, it's playtime still. I'll get the football out and I try to hit the kids in the head or in the back or whatever. And they're all trying to make cool catches. And, and, and it's it's fun until it's time to get going. And we have prayer, then they realize it's, it's time to get going. But if my personality, I think, I want them to, to have fun. I want them to, you know, there's nitty gritty times and like, hey, we got to cut. We, we got to really get down and start working hard right now. But I want them to have fun before that. And I'll joke with them before practice, after practice, sometimes during practice, you know, and it makes them happy. And then they know they're safe. They're getting the stuff that they need. They have success. And it just kind of compounds on itself all the time. They want, it, it's crazy. I, I'll say we have crazy parents. But it's really not that the crazy parents, your kids want to come to practice. Absolutely. You know, when we're saying, like, hey, we need to take a break, we've been practicing too much or whatever, they'll be like, let's practice. You know, so we're constantly practicing, never have to, hey, we need to get the kids back in here. No, they're calling either Lonnie, Pete, or me, like, hey, when do we get going in practice? You know. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. And I, you know, I I, I see, you know, I think about some great sports people or even people in the great business world or whatever. And you think I'll just re use names, Joe Montana, um, John Elway, who are some other more recent ones. They retire when they stop having fun. All of them do. And you, you know, you think I, I was talking to Pete about this earlier. I caution parents that all they want to do is get their kid a college scholarship, college scholarship, college scholarship, college scholarship, college scholarship for whatever sport it is. And so many of those kids burn out and quit because what happens is you took a sport that is fun to them and you turn it into a job. So if your kid is not having fun and they don't absolutely love it, the college level is probably not going to be for them. And so it's great that you guys just have so much fun. And I see it in your room. You know, when I bring kids up there, there was, it was always a good time. So in your playbook, Pete, and then the next question is for you, Lonnie. In your playbook, Pete, you talk about – having fun actually and that's awesome and you talk about home run moves and being exciting to watch tell me about that you talking to me or lonnie yeah no lonnie's next pete oh, you're right. here okay. now talking okay. about and I'll, and I'll tell you a bit um that just so you know like the, the, that playbook is is a, just my disclaimer is a little bit mean a lot Abel, a lot Lonnie, a lot Brent Barnes, a lot Cyber. You know, it's a, it's a compilation. Like, I don't want you to think like I thought all that stuff up. The greatest coaches are the greatest thieves, you know, like kind of regurgitate, but then also innovate things too. And it's like, sure. so so the fun stuff, like I learned a bunch of that from these guys, you know. Yeah, it's um, awesome. yeah. And 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 I think, you know, because, and, and I'll tell you, when I, my first head coaching job, I didn't have as much fun as we should have in that, in that way, you know. I came here and... And I, uh, I I saw these guys having fun. It's like it, that sort of 
you know, really, really grabbed me and, 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 you know, I started integrating that more to myself, but, and, and part of it too, is I, I think I coached college right before high school. And so I, I brought this mindset where it's like, you got to understand your, 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 your group. But what was your question about home runs and what was the other stuff? Well, when you talk about fun in your program, you know, you talk about having a home run move and being exciting to watch. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we try to preach to our kids, like at all levels, at all levels, like, you got to have tools, man. You got to have, you know, and it can be anything. Like we don't try to pigeonhole kids to, hey, you have to have a double leg takedown and this and this and this. I mean, there's lots of core cool principles we teach uh, fundamentally, but we always try to take, you know, tall, small, big, whatever, and we try to adapt those kids' strengths and 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 make it fun for the kids. So that's, I think, that's a lot of fun for the kid as well. Where we're not constantly on a kid's case, like you can't do that anymore. We'll try to maybe take that and make it a strength form. And now it's there. It's fun. You know, it's there. Now it's their home run move. And, and when they really get good at it, now they're a home run threat. You know, it's like it's not just a home run where it's lucky. It's like this kid's got a good head lock. You better watch out. This yeah, kid's got a good head, you better watch out. And that's exciting and fun. And we try to preach to our kids like, hey, you, you, we want people to come and have a good time and enjoy what we want to put on a show. Like they should enjoy to come watch you wrestle because it's fun to compete that way. You know? Well, I remember again, I'm going to because you guys are a great model. And I don't know who teaches your kids. I know I was always, as a high school coach and a club coach, I would see like 10 coaches on the Post Falls wrestling staff. And I'm like, how in the world can a team compete with that? <laughs> and it's awesome. I think absolutely phenomenal that you guys have enough inspiration and collaboration and people want to be in your team that uh, that many parents want to help out. And I, it was actually at the district championships watching Tyler Morris a couple of years ago. And I don't know the name of the move. I still can't remember, but it's a power. Yeah. You have a power wizard on or an ankle wizard, whatever you want to call it. And I know I'm getting really technical for non wrestlers that are watching this, but, um, and then it's a tilt. There's a name for that. What's What is that name? You guys know? Probably it was like a roll off like a It's a person's name in college, then it's a tilt. But basically, you tilt them from the power wizard. And I was thinking, I had just seen it. I think it was kind of an invented move like two weeks before at the NCAAs or something. <laughs> Tyler's using it two weeks later. Yeah, Tyler's using it two weeks later. I'm like, I can't compete with that. <laughs> so you guys are just awesome. So that's – you have fun. That's part of the, the four the, – the, the acronym F-A-C-T. The fun is very, very important. You got the family. You got the friendships. You got the fulfilling. Because um, one thing about fun is if you let a kid have fun all the time, we know what they'd be doing. They'd be playing video games. But that's not fulfilling. They would not remember what score they got on Minecraft 20 years from now, but they will remember the wrestling ride but on the bus to the state championships, and that's fulfilling. So good job about doing that, gentlemen. And so I want to get into – you talk a lot about um, ownership of coaches, ownership of the club, ownership of the parents, and, that re and, and also kind of ownership of the kids and the character of the kids. That comes down to autonomy. Okay, so – Lonnie, what is your role as a club coach? You know, the autonomy, what, what, how do you see your, your, your role fitting in easily with Pete? This, you guys don't know how special you guys have it. Um, in other programs, the club coaches don't want to follow what the high school does. Middle school doesn't want to follow what the high school does. High school doesn't want to be involved in the club. And you guys have a great, great thing going on. So what is that autonomy that you feel you have, Lonnie, in, in coaching the club kids. It doesn't seem like it's really difficult for you. You do a great job. Can you describe that? Well, my role has changed over the years quite a bit. You know, I used to be a hands-on coach. I've always coached the entry level kids, four to six year olds. Um, most of the technique and what goes on in the wrestling room nowadays is Abel. It's, um, it ends with Abel's technique. And then before you get to Abel's group, we're trying to prepare you for Abel's technique. My role in the club now largely is I'm a relationship builder. That's what I do. I build relationships with parents. Um, I take care of problem parents. <laughs> um, it's a good job. Uh, I understand. It's, the kids are never the problem. <laughs> they still them are. And when they, they, the kids are problems, but they're an easy problem to deal with. That's right. And sometimes kids are problems because they want to be dealt with. And that's easy. We've identified all of that. Well, always the most difficult thing in a wrestling club, especially a club of our size, is dealing with parents and, you know, 
with all the, the the good and the bad that comes with that. But building relationships is a huge part of what we do, and that has a, that plays in directly to the longevity of the kids in our program. Why so many kids start out at youth level and we see them wrestling still at the high school level? I mean, not all of them are, are state champs and and winning titles and stuff, but um, I don't know. I think Pete could to attest better to this, but I think that our high school high school room at the beginning of every season we have 60 to 80 kids um Incredible. as far as yeah, this last year we had 83 kids to start this last year oh my goodness that's amazing congratulations guys that's that's awesome for wrestling because i love wrestling so much that's just awesome that's a good job that's oh, really? that's great so what so abel when you're coaching the kids I, and i found this to be very important at all age groups what kind of autonomy do you give the kids in the club program as you coach them? Well, I'm not, first off, I'm not sure what you mean by autonomy. Are you, you mean- like, well, for, oh, for example, autonomy means everybody in, in their mind wants to be um, in charge of their own destiny, okay? Mm -hmm. So for example, when you have a five-year-old wrestler, um, you say, today you get to choose the game, and they get so excited. Yes, we're going to choose God's ball. Okay. When you have a 15-year-old wrestler, you say, tomorrow you lead practice. Does that make sense? So I found that that was huge in our own program. But if you study athletes and you study teams what and how you develop people, everybody wants to be in charge of their own destiny or to appear to be in charge of their own destiny. And that's different for every type of individual depending on their, their background, their experience, and their age. What kind of autonomy do you give the kids? I mean, do they get to choose what tournaments did they go to? Do they get to choose, you know, what what what, do you, what would you say about that, Abel? Um, I would say most of that is not, it's all them anyways, because they always tell me where the tournaments are at. I don't, I really don't pay attention to it. So <laughs> They're like, hey, hey, can you go to this tournament? Can you go to that tournament? I don't know anything about the tournaments. I just, I'll sometimes ask, hey, what tournament's coming up so we can make a push for this, you know, or, or, or get some extra workouts in or whatever. Um, but most of the, if I'm getting it correctly, the biggest thing that I give the kids is everything's on their honor. So I'll give them something to do. Like I'll say, hey, let's do, and it's, they're bad examples, but I'll say, like, uh, let's get 20 push ups, 20 sit ups, and 20 jump ups and it's on your honor. You can do five, you can do seven and be done. Doesn't matter. Um, and quite often, I, don't, I, would, I would say probably maybe once or twice a month, I'll tell the kids, you can work as hard as you want to. I, I, I can't make you do anything. It's completely up to you. If you want to be better, then get more reps. If you want to be stronger, then lift more weights. If you want to get more endurance, then run better. But it's always up to you. In practice, if you want to make yourself super tired, go as hard as you can for the whole practice, it's completely up to you. I can't make you do anything, you know, and so then I think it gives them ownership and they decide like, yeah, okay, this is on me. I got it. That's awesome. Yes, that's huge. And it really, and you know, especially kids, I think most people in general, they actually respond to that. They respond very positively because now they know it's up to them. You're not telling them. You're like you can do whatever you want, but you're not. You might not get better if you don't. Well, that's that's amazing. That's really really cool. And so, you know, um, Pete. I mean, this is to all you guys because um, you know I, I know you don't just write that book and everybody's involved in it. But one of the things you talk about in there is especially early in the season is building confidence and you know uh, choosing easy tournaments and easy to you guys by the way is not necessarily easy to other teams but anyway i won't get into that <laughs> but um building that confidence and i think this is where a lot of actual teams fail is that and this is the confidence part of it is that you take a kid early in the season and if you take him to a tough tournament or a tough duels or whatever and he gets his butt whooped that could affect him for the rest of the season it absolutely could. And, and uh, you know, this is one thing Coach Sprague always talked about is all kids want to see a positive self-image in the mirror. And so it is about building their confidence. And so, so Pete, can you, can you describe, you know, how you plan the season um, and then, you know, about building that confidence for kids? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, as far as building the, the actual season itself, we try to 
I mean, we try to have quality competition throughout the whole thing, of course, and that, that's evolved with time. You know, like like you said about our schedule now, we've had the last several years we've been blessed with with teams that we can take on a very tough schedule. You know, that, that so it, it might look differently than, than another team or something that's kind of starting out or whatever at a different level. But that said, we, we, we try to make it so that, um, you know, the, the season is balanced in a sense. And, and, and I don't mean to be sort of nebulous about this, but it's like, every team is a little bit different and so while we were talking earlier about front ending with lots of drilling you know before christmas well that principle holds true for every team but some teams we might start live wrestling a little bit sooner than others because there's just a little bit more season than they need it or they're yeah. chopping a little too much and same thing with the calendar it's like you know we look at okay who do we got coming back what's the type of team we have and then you also balance that with hey we're going to go to tri-state we're going to go to raw you know, we've been blessed to go to Sydney and, and go out there a uh, number of years. And so there's those kind of plugins, you know, and then we'll try to build it around that, like some quality duels. And, and and sometimes the answer to that question is rather than sometimes more is less. Let me say it this way. Sometimes we look at it and we might say, you know, we could fit a tournament here in January. But is that the right call to, to put our kids through another tournament three weekends in a row, four weekends in a row? Would, we, would it be better to either have the, the weekend off that weekend? And, and just, hey, just, just go be a kid, or would it be better to have a really quality dual meet that weekend? So we might say, hey, you know, Ording or Lake Stevens or whoever, like, come and we just want to have, like, two really tough matches to, to, to be challenged, but we don't want to grind our kids and get yeah. them to up, right? So there's a lot of factors that come into that, and I think you got to kind of look at all those things. And that's, like, all a kind of conversation of our high school coaches and Abel and Lonnie. And, I mean, just kind of bouncing a lot of stuff around. They're not involved as much, but... But these guys, you know, it's like they, they have a lot of connections and ideas, too. And so it's kind of a, a group conversation a bit. And I'll come to these guys. Hey, I'm thinking about coming to this tournament and that tournament kind of, you know, and I'll, I'll sound sound more ideas off of them. And what do you think about traveling to Minnesota or what? It's like, yeah, you know, so that that I think generates excitement as well. You know, it's like you kind of dangle a carrot out there for kids. And hey, next year or two years from now, maybe we could go to this place or we could go to that place. And it sort of dangles that out there for those kids. Yeah, well, that's awesome. That, that, yeah, well, whatever you guys are doing is definitely worked. And I, I remember my first year as a high school coach, and of course, I'm really overzealous and you know into it. We're wrestling every weekend, and your kids get 50 matches in a year. Um, I didn't know any different, right? And we go to this, and it was a really good tournament. And I'm like, and um, Brian Huber shows up, right? And he's he's not wrestling that weekend. I'm like. How come he's not wrestling? He's resting or something? And I'm like, these guys got the secret sauce. And so I knew that I got to pair it back a little bit here. So, uh, but it was, it was uh, obviously, it was, a, I, I just love the journey. So, Lonnie, I want you to answer this one. And so, it, through all your guys' literature that I've seen, all your documents, all your, I guess, standard operating procedures of building a good team and keeping a good team, I mean, these guys even talk about how to fundraise and goals for fundraising. And, when I saw your guys' goals for fundraising, I was like, oh my gosh, most teams would salivate over that. So kudos to you guys. You guys have said, whenever you go to a tournament up in Post Falls, you see so many parents helping out. That is rare. It just is. It's really, really rare. So really good job, you guys. But Lonnie, I want you to ans answer this one. So the last thing with the acronym FACT, FACT, is team. Everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. You guys obviously have the real life church, and I think there's faith. Everybody wants to be a part of God and you're on your guys' teams. You can see that. You guys want to you have this in your procedures and your document, building character and building a true champion. Lonnie, um, are you familiar with that? I'm assuming you are. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about what it means to build a true champion? That's what you guys call it, a true champion. And by the way, viewers. This has less to do with wrestling than it does just being a good human being. So talk about that, Lonnie, true champion. So the true champion um, logo or slogan, or, you know, that actually was brought, to, brought by Pete way after the fact. Uh, Pete was the true champion guy, and it so fell in. It, really what it did is it gave a name to what Abel and I and the team real life. It's not Abel and I. There's a whole bunch of people involved in team real life, and there have been over the last 20 years some really important, important characters to to have built that to what it is today but abel and i were, were, were doing it when pete got here and it really to be a true champion put a name on what we were already doing absolutely and that really is is to be a champion on and off the mat yeah. and it's way bigger than winning or losing in fact it doesn't factor in at all 
the winning the losing. Right. Um, who you are, how you behave, yourself, what what your values are, and how you demonstrate that, and how you show that. That's that's really what what goes into being a true champion to us is. And you know, Pete, Pete's done a great job in the high school level of finding a kid and calling them out and giving them a true champion T-shirt for something that maybe had nothing to do with wrestling at all. That's awesome. Maybe it was you weren't wrestling that weekend and you gave this kid your shoes so he could or whatever. Um, but it was just an opportunity to call a kid out for showing exceptional character. And sometimes it could have been a very small thing, but for that kid, it may have been a huge step. You know, we've That's got some wrestlers. I say statistically, we have as many troubled wrestlers who, who get into trouble or who are not or whatever as any other school. Um, the difference between us being a faith-based organization or a faith-based, faith-based wrestling club is that we'll call you out on it. And we're going to call you out on, on a different level. And so sometimes to be a true champion, maybe a very small act by a wrestler, and but it's a huge act for that wrestler. So Pete's been doing a great job, and the rest of the high school staff as well is being able to identify that in a kid that this is a this is a kid who demonstrated something very small, but for him it was very big, and identifying that. You know, that you didn't yeah. you didn't throw your head. You said you mentioned earlier that you don't see real life kids throwing their head here or throwing tantrums this and that. Well, they do. But they just don't live in it. We don't let them continue to do it. Well, I, I I have another story for that. Abel might remember it. I didn't know him really well then, but I knew the the character of your guys' program. And my son was wrestling a team real life kid. And it wasn't the kid that was a problem. It was his dad coaching that side that was the problem. And it was just I'm like, I mean, you, you know, um, actually security was called and everything. It was that bad. And I'm like. I'm not the type of guy that says, oh, let's go get that guy. But I'm like, you know what? I bet you Abel wants to know about this. And I called him up, I think, on a Sunday night or a Monday or something. And he's like, oh, my God, I had no idea. I'll take care of it. I never saw the dad again. And you, so you guys live it. You guys are not afraid to say these are our values. This is what we're going to stick by. And it's not acceptable to do certain things. And so I felt more sorry for the kid as did Abel. I remember the conversation, but anyway, so kudos to you guys, kudos, just really, really good job. You want to add though, uh, I mean, cause there's instances of that, that happens, but I think our kids get to see, like, especially myself, I'll call myself out if, if, if I did something wrong. So they know that we're all just humans and we're all fallible. But again, if we, we hold each other accountable. We know we're going to make mistakes and we bounce back. One of the biggest things that I pray about every every time we pray is that God did down on a cross for all of our sins because there's no way we're going to make it without it. You know, we, we can try to be the best that we can. I'm just giving us a little bit of a new way the, the expectation like is would be too much. You know, it'd be, yeah. and you need God in your life to, to kind of uh, squash that feeling of like, oh, I made a mistake and, now I can't come back from it. I'm like, no, you can come back from anything. So there's been dads that have done things like that, and then sure. we 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 brought them back. Like, all right, this uh, water under the bridge, dude. Let's just start cleaning. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure it depends also, like like with with Christ, wow. right? I mean, what's our heart feel like? I mean, are we going to repent from it, and do we want to change? That's the biggest thing, and I, because I I fail every single day, we all do, right? I mean, that's human that's human nature, and so. But I do know that we have a Savior that died for us, and and I have another day to to, to live, and He's gonna love love me no matter what. Which is, I know, a hard concept to understand. <laughs> but yes, no matter what, He's going to love us. I can't explain it. I just can't. So, so you guys have been great. I have a couple of other questions for for you guys, and so this thing, the theme of this podcast is never be outworked, and I know. I mean, I've seen your guys' training schedule, and you know, obviously, you guys have heard this in your room, and you've seen it, of course. Um, a lot of programs don't get to see it, but every kid wants to be a state champion. Every kid wants to do this, and then you say, "Okay, get up at six a.m. I'll meet you at the gym. We'll train, and then we'll train after school again. And then you got to lift weights, and then you still got to get your school work done." Oh, I guess I don't want to be a state champion. So you guys have two a day workouts. You have 10 months worth of training. It looks like August and September is usually you take off. And so obviously you guys have a never be at work mindset. And a, a lot of your kids, by the way, good kids, even state champs in wrestling, they do other sports as well. And really, really incredible. And so how do you think the never be at work mindset? Obviously, every, I can just see it in you guys, Lonnie, Pete, and Abel. You guys all have that mindset. 
So I, how I, I want every one of you to talk about it. How did Lonnie, how does that at your level, if you're involved with the club and with wrestling and post falls, how does that never be out work mindset work for you? What does that, how does it apply to your team? So first of all, I have to tell you, I'm not the fun coach. I'm not the fun guy. I remember, <laughs> I remember able to not practice one time and I see this football flying around and I go out and I grab it and I'm just going to hang on to it. And Abel's like, Hey man, who's got the football? And I said, I do. <laughs> He's like, here. I'm like, is it yours? He's like, yes. So Abel, Abel, He's really responsible for the fun, fun of the wrestling room. I'm an intense guy, and I came from an intense, an intense wrestling club, and it was, it was never about fun. I've learned that. I've learned that over the last 20 years to, to let it be fun. And it was important for my own son as a wrestler to have fun, and, and, and Abel did a great job with all of that. Yeah. So, But as far as the never be outworked uh, mindset in the room, it's really easy for us at this point. You know, We practice in Pulse Falls High School most of the time, and I have this wall right there, and it has your name, the names. State champs, runner up, seconds, thirds, fourths, team titles. And are you guys going to have to build a new building just for all the names <laughs> on that wall? I'm serious. I'm like, that wall is going to get filled up really quick. <laughs> it, it's, it's, and it's, it's really heavy on the championship side, and that's really awesome. awesome. Um, so that is an easy thing to do. It is an easy thing for, and this, this, the peak comes into this. He does a great job of getting those high school wrestlers, the ones who are in the paper every week, the ones who are winning state titles, the ones who are winning national titles. They get their time with our kids. And so we have the role model right there. And, and it's easy to say these kids did this. This is what we do. This is what we do at this level to be at that level. This is what you do now to get your name on the wall. And it's, it's, it's really easy. That's but, awesome. I, Pete Nabel, what do you have to add to that? That's amazing. Good job, Lonnie. That's awesome. Um, we, I don't think we're ever out work for it. I think we've got it down. Well, I can at least speak to my, for myself that it's efficient. What we have is really efficient. We get the most out of the time that we do. Because if you ask around, people don't believe when they say, when I tell them we practice twice a week at Whip Real Life. We do uh, usually about an hour and a half, and it's just – Play, play hard, play hard, then full-blown wrestling practice, drill, 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 and then the last 15 minutes, life. I mean, there's no downtime. It's efficient. It's, it's we're going, and you're going to get the most out of it. And then even right when it's over, I'll throw in a couple extra things. Uh, me and Pete have the same clock. We don't have a clock. We look like this. <laughs> you know, we're going to be done by 7.30, and it's like 7.55, and people are like, hey, what time are we getting out of here? Like, well, we're, we're getting a little bit extra in there. I can't get out till we get this down right, you know. But then I'll, I'll have the kids condition on their own. Outside. We have, excuse me, guys. We have a caller on the line. Can you hear us? I can hear you. I can hear you. Hey, guys, gentlemen, we have Troy Steiner on the line. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So, Troy, be easy on us. I just interrupted Abel De La Rosa, <laughs> but I saw your call. I'm like, I got to take this. So Troy Steiner, he is an NCAA champ from Iowa. He's on the line right now. I consider him a friend of mine, a mentor, amazing coach. He's the head coach of the Fresno uh, State Bulldogs now and the, the Olympic training facility out there in the Valley in California and going to do an amazing job, and I look forward to what's going to happen. Troy, what do you want to hear from us now? You know, I just wanted to call and thank you guys for all you do. I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, being in the position I'm in now, you know, you, people think like you sometimes they look at you like you have all the information, but I tell you what, I seek out information and try to learn from everyone and and just listen to you guys talk and how you're building your program or have built the program and continue to do the things you do It, you know, Man, it's, it's awesome. I mean, you get to remember that coaches out there, you're the most influential people in the world, right? I mean, you're the most influential people to these kids in, in their lives, and, and you have don't take it lightly. You know, it's, it's such a opportunity to reach these guys and really mold them into the people you want and, and the people that our society needs. So, 
I just want to thank, call and thank you guys for what you do. Oh man, uh, thank Coach, you what you're doing. Uh, Coach Diner, thank you very much. That means so much. Say hello to him, guys. Thank you, thanks, Diner. Coach. Yeah, thank you, Coach. Thank you. I'm staying on the line because you know, um, Coach Diner. You know, I haven't coached for a couple of years now, and I stepped um, down um, a couple of years ago. But it is an amazing feeling to have be walking around town. I'm just walking around, crossing the sidewalk. And you guys have all you guys all feel this, I know. And you'll hear a kid stick out his head out the window and say, "Hey, coach!" I'm like, "Who's that?" You know, when you coached the kid when he was eight years old, and it it, it is it's an amazing feeling. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, so, okay, so we got Coach Steiner on the line, so we got to ask him. Okay, so what do you know about NCAA wrestling for the season this year? What are we, what are we hearing, Coach? I think we will have a season. I think it's, you know, it's looking like it, it will be pushed back to the January start date probably. But um, nothing is set or confirmed right now, but that's kind of what it's looking like when we talk to the other coaches. You know, the National Wrestling Coaches Association, you know, most coaches have, you know, felt it would be in our best interest as a sport to push it back to January. So I think that's kind of where it's, what we're looking at. But um, nothing is confirmed right now. So as of, as of right now, we're still kind of planning on going in November. And, and, and you know, the NCAA is not going to change our season. They aren't going to move the NCAs. They're not going to move the start of our season any date. So... As of right now, until we hear more, you know, we we look to start in November. But I, I really think it will be pushed to January. Excellent. Well, well, thanks for that information. So, who should we look at? At what weight class and what the name should we look at for uh, the Bulldogs this year, Coach? Well, I, I'm I'm I just want to get back with my guys right now. I haven't seen some of them since March, so it's wow. I'm going crazy a, a little bit. Wow. Um, that's why I'm watching watching you guys live on Facebook in the middle of the afternoon. But, <laughs> well, uh, that's awesome. Well, but, you know, uh, what you're doing in that program, by the way, I am really excited for it. You you have a great potential to recruit some great kids. You're already doing it, and I've seen changes in your program already in the last couple of years that you've taken it over. So kudos to you, Coach. Really, really good job. No, thank you, guys. But, you know, it, it all comes from, you know, getting the athletes like you guys are creating up there and, and – uh, you know, we get more of those type of kids in here, the better off we're going to be. So just uh, thanks again. Excellent. Well, thanks for the call. Do you have anything to add? This is like, it made my day, Coach. Thanks for calling in. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> no, no, keep going. I need to learn some more. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Hey, we'll be in touch, Coach. Let's talk soon. Okay. All right. All right. Take care. Bye. That was awesome, by the way. That was awesome. <laughs> was he up there at uh, Beat the Streets? I, I thought... Um, I, yes, he was because um, Joe Cologne was there. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was warming up. Yeah. yeah, he was at Beat the Streets. That was. Did you guys watch that match, Cologne versus Gross? Oh, man, I did. Thirty points or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. It, it, it'll be interesting to see um, how those guys compete against Spencer Lee. Uh, it, it's going to be. Uh, that's going to be a tough weight class, man. Fifty-seven. Yeah. So, yeah. But, okay. So we're in the middle of never be outworked. Abel, I had to interrupt when I saw Coach Diner. So I'm like, I got to interrupt this. The, the, you. So you're talking about the never be outworked. And you guys aren't outworked. You guys have lots of fun. Uh, again, Abel, they, everybody gives you credit. I see that credit for the fun part of it. Your, your boys have fun, even though they're multiple time state champions. And so so talk about the never be outworked mindset. Well, how do you pass that on to your kids? Um, well, also, we wrestle the two times a week. And it's real efficient. We get a lot done during those two times. And then I tell them if they want to condition, they condition on their own. And again, it's on their honor. If they want to get better, they have to put the time in. You tell the parents that Lonnie will talk to the parents and, and get them on board too. And then the diehards, we usually have about, you know, 15 to 20 diehards. And they'll want to get an extra practice in. And it'll be a high level going all out until we're done. That's what it's for, you know. And, and again, if there's... Um, some scouting that I need to do with, with my parents will tell me all the time, like, Hey, my son can't beat Johnny or whatever. And they'll show me the match and then we'll figure it out right then and there. Like how we're going to, I love out. that. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's a, that's a very fun part of it. And so good job that you can do that. And so my last question for you guys, as we wrap this up is I want one of you guys to take it and you guys can choose who, 
Um, so obviously, people probably don't see it on the outside because you guys do. You have an efficient program. You have a great character building program. People see almost a perfect program. We know that doesn't exist. We know there's adversity. We know there are failures. Okay. So one of you, or you can all take it, you know, tell us about one apparent failure in your program that maybe you guys thought was a failure. Somebody from the outside might not have seen it or somebody from the outside might've thought it was a failure, but it actually caused more success for you guys. Do you guys have anything that comes out off the top of your mind? I, I got something. It might not be okay. Abel, go and then if you got if, uh, Pete and Lonnie, if you have something, we have time for that too. So go ahead, yeah, go ahead, what, Abel. What helps drive me is um, we were part of the Central Valley Wrestling Club for quite some time, and they wanted to go in a little bit different direction. So when I when I was at both of them in real life and Central Valley at the same time, and then when they when they kind of got me out and won't name any names, it was a driving force for me. You know, it made me more more dedicated to the real life program because of that. And then also too, uh, on the other side, that there's people in Coeur d'Alene that weren't very happy with us going to real life. And yeah. their, their negativity drove me to more positive stuff and, and to yeah. be more active and, and, and continues to give me a little bit more drive. Uh, well. Often. Kudos to you. I, I know that feeling that let's just, I'm going to use this term, Abel, because I know all you guys are winners, by the way. You just are. You have winning mindsets. Winners have haters. Believe me, I have lots of them. And it doesn't bother me anymore because I know losers don't have haters. I mean, I, that, that, I say that with all humility. The people that actually sit on the couch and do nothing can make fun of wrestling coaches and make fun of people that try to start things. They're the ones that are going to push somebody out, right? But here's what I love about your guys' program is and this i know i know the negativity that you're speaking about abel i absolutely everybody hears it right here's what i say build a program like post falls and people will want to wrestle for you too mm -hmm. period I, I mean it's like well well they moved to go go to post falls or they took their kid to post falls then build something better it's called a free market luckily we have that in idaho that you can kind of do that you can't do that in all states by the way and so i i actually like that you know, that you can go choose a program that if you, if you think your kid should go there, you get them there. And you guys have done that. And that's I think that's really, really awesome because you – especially what's awesome about what you guys have done is you not only get great wrestlers, you get great kids. You get great – and it's great for Post Falls. It's great for the school district. It's great for the community. So that's really, really awesome. So kudos to you, Abel. I want to hear about that later on a personal level. I would love to talk to you about it because I know those things aren't easy. We take them all personal. Um, as successful people because we do care about what people think. I want to hear that story. I'd love to if you could get vulnerable with me transparent. I might call you someday and talk more about that. So Lonnie, Pete, yeah. do you guys have a, a story about maybe an apparent failure in your or related to the team or with you and related to the team that actually turned into more success for you guys? I don't have a specific parent failure. Um, I will say this though. Um, as a ministry, you know, and I was never trained to, to run a ministry or, or in, you know, I don't have any official training or anything like that, you know, but actually when we started the club, Jim Putman took care of all that himself. And clearly there's no one better than that, than that guy right there. Um, but I've taken some slack from a lot of people who aren't completely familiar with the program for being successful. Um, this baby is a church program. We were expected not to focus on winning your or, or not expected to have success. Um, I and I'd like to say we don't focus on winning. Um, I'd like to say, I mean, sometimes we do. We do, obviously, but we're human nature and we are competitive guys and we want to win. If you've been in the opposite corner of me, I am fiercely competitive in the corner of <laughs> So am I. So am I, I uh, maybe, maybe more so they are. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and my, my take on that and, and how, what I've come away with from that and the lesson in it, in it is, is the success is the honey. If we don't have a successful program or we're not winning, then I get kids who are already in it or are already in the church or who are already coming to faith based people and that's why they want to come. But I want the kids who aren't. I want the kids who don't come from a, from a family of faith or don't have a relationship with Jesus, right. who don't who don't know him or don't know that lifestyle, and they've never had that lived out in front of them. Those are the kids that I want, and we don't get those kids without the success. 
Ronnie, so, that's, that's awesome. Thanks for being vulnerable. Thanks for being authentic. I'm going to say this. It's not easy to say, but I tend to say things that I don't really care if people are offended or not. One of the, I'm just saying this is not um, – and Aaron and Jim would probably tell you this, okay? And we, we know them very well with, with real life. But, and I consider Aaron a great friend and a mentor and my pastor. I will always consider him my pastor no matter where he's at. And so – but here's what we know is Christians don't do a good job at discipleship, and Christ wants us to be disciples. The way to be disciples is attract as many people as possible in a positive way, period. If that's because you have a winning program – Ah, well, that's, 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 that's okay. But I think, unfortunately, in our Christian society, and, and a lot of churches are, gosh, they're um, victims to this, winning is not Christian-like. I, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, I know. I think you do. I, 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 I could talk about it a lot. Believe me, my brother and I talk about this, and that's just – that's wrong. That's just not, that's not right. That's not, we can win. We can, men and women are wired to win. They're wired to compete. They're wired to be productive. Okay. And you guys have done that with your program. So Lonnie, keep doing what you're doing. I'm always going to stand behind you. Keep being a disciple, attract as many people as you can. And that's what God, that's what God and Jesus wanted us to do. So thank you very much. So Pete, man, that's, those are two acts that are hard to follow right there. So can you tell me an apparent failure that caused more success for Team Real Life or Post Falls Wrestling or yourself and how it relates to the team? Well, I would say, so I had time to think while they were both talking. So um, I was thinking about specific instances of, of failures or screw ups. And then it occurred to me there's there's too many to, to nail down one one thing. And what I mean is there's just, I can think back to five or six things where I'm like, gosh, darn, I can't believe I screwed up on that. Or, that, that, that I missed that or that I, I blew that relationship encounter. Or there, there's a handful of those, you know what I mean? And, and I think really more than anything for me, and, and I'm not trying to spin it and, and make the bad question turn into a positive, but really this is truly what I believe, which is um, I think that, that a lot of our success has, has to do with overcoming those struggles, you know, along the way and learning from them and changing. And I, I, I mean everything from – Screwing up on rules stuff accidentally and having to self-report to screwing up on relationship stuff to learning how to deal with parents the right way to learning how to, uh, but, but I, I would say one constant is this uh, in our program, and I think this is where it really relates back to, uh, to organizations in general, which is our leadership has been like this, like this together. Yeah, so our leadership has been very, very tight. I would say that that's even 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 forged with god as well i mean because that's at the center of it i mean there's and i would and, and so i want to get again a little bit more personal on the personal side there are times that that we have fallen short of uh, you know what we could have done with his kid before his kids before whether it was just a screw up there are a couple and, and you know there, there's been a couple of tournaments where whatever happened and, and and somebody you know got in trouble or whatever just little stuff dumb, dumb stuff that happened and and you and there's been things with Lonnie where you know a, a few, speaking frankly a few years ago Rich had was trying we were trying to get into a weight class that was extremely hard to get to. Right. <laughs> this type of relationship ripples can ruin relationships in, right. in this game at this level at this level of elite elite high school sports it can yeah. ruin a relationship between us and me and Lonnie and yeah. and and I think to the credit of our organization, I'm not trying to stroke these guys, I'm just being honest here, to the credit of our organization, we've always been on the same page, and when there's been a disagreement, or not even a disagreement, just a misunderstanding, or a, we've talked it out, we've said, no man, I got your back, and you got mine, and we're gonna freaking get through this, and we'll be just fine. And I think that good organizations have that, and, and, and need to keep building that. Constantly. Well, you know, it's because, this is just my assessment, my observation, as a scientist and just studying these things is that you're, you're totally right. You have to nail on the head, Pete. And it's because you guys believe in something and are part of something bigger than the team. And that's huge. That's not, not every team has that. It's, it's hard to find faithful people that are as close as you guys that are, uh, that are as connected as you guys um, to a faith or to God or something like that. It's very, very difficult. It, and it, and you know, the struggles in leadership pull, pulls teams apart. You guys have seen it. We've seen it in the media. We've seen it in the public. We've seen it on sports teams. And so you're hundred percent correct. You said earlier that, that, and I've said this to these guys many times, they have too, but 
club coaches by a general rule do not get along with high school coaches nope. in many places. <laughs> I mean, that's yep. usually the rub is, is they fall apart because the club coach is going this way, high school coach is going that way and da, 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 da. Yeah. And so it's, 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 it's great to have everybody on the same page, but it's not something that it's like, a, it, you know, it's and not to make it sound funny when you compare it to marriage, but I remember a long time ago, a mentor told me, how's your marriage doing? I said, oh, you know, it's all right. He said, I'm telling you, it's like a muscle. If you don't work it out, it will atrophy. Mm-hmm. And leadership is the same way, man. If you don't work it out and work at it, it will atrophy. No, that's that. That's absolutely true. And it's kudos to you guys. You guys are an inspiration, um, not only because of wrestling and your championships and all the statistics, but what I, I appreciate about you guys is just looking at and seeing how faithful you guys are, uh, Jesus believers, God followers. I, I love that. You know, every single year as a fan, I'd be like, okay, let's see. Abel's oldest is graduating, so they're not going to have a good team next year. <laughs> no. where, are these kids? where are these freshman kids come from? He's in the state finals. You know? And then it's like, okay, now his second oldest graduated. We're not going to have a good team. This, they're not going to have a good team this year. Here comes another freshman that I've never seen before. <laughs> and I, you guys have that secret sauce that if you hold it together, and I know actually that's hard to do. Like you said, Pete, it's like a muscle. If you keep that together, I don't see this changing. And – Kudos to you guys. I appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, thank you very, very much. This has been the most touching podcast I've probably had. So I really, really appreciate it. I'm very ba- passionate about this leadership, this topic, um, and and wrestling, of course. And so follow me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on LinkedIn. Visit my website at drsdm.com. You'll see this edited and ready to go on my YouTube channel, SoundCloud, Spotify, and iTunes in the next week or so. You guys can follow it there. And uh, Lonnie, Pete, and Abel, thank you very much, very, very much. Let's be in touch. Abel, I'm going to call you. I want to hear more about some of these stories. So so thank you guys very, very much. Let's be in touch. I can't wait for the wrestling season. I'm always cheering for you guys for so many more reasons than just your wrestling. So thank you very, very much and good luck to you guys. And uh, we'll talk soon.